How many of you, I have to ask you this question, like making an entrance, like making it special when you walk in the room? So, all right, some of you are shaking your head. Some of you are like, I like to be the person that no one even knows was there. Right? You, you, don't, want, you don't want anybody to make a big deal about it. They're just like, oh, when did you get here? That kind of thing. Yeah, that, that, some of you are that person. But some of you are like, yeah, life of the party right here. Stepped in the room. And, and sometimes there's those moments where that making of an entrance is particularly special. Uh, not, not only for ceremonial purposes, but for honor. Uh, in, in our culture, in our, in our nation, we, we have a particular honor for uh, presidents. Uh, whenever they enter the room, they, someone will announce the President of the United States. And there will be a song playing, Hail to the Chief. And, and, and that's their, their official making of an interest that they have arrived. And usually being the person that's the President, they're usually the guest of honor or the most highest position person in a party or an event. Uh, locally, we, most of them have probably never experienced a moment where the president has walked in the room, uh, but you have probably understood the moment of importance of honoring someone walking to the room if you've ever been to a wedding. And to a wedding, you have people ushering the parents and sometimes the grandparents, and, and the groom is at front, but you know who everybody stands for. Whenever the bride comes in, and makes that entrance. Everybody stands. Everybody turns to look. The groom is grinning ear to ear. And if you're like me, I'm grinning ear to ear. And I'm probably squelching out tears also. Because I'm like, she's so beautiful. It's amazing. How could I ever? Yeah, I won the lottery on that. So anyways, uh, <laughs> she didn't expect me to say that this morning, by the way. Um, anyways, it's, it's making an interest that's a, that's a special moment that's worthy of honor. And so as we look at this, while Jesus did not plan for everything that would happen in that moment, he did plan for certain particulars that were biblical, that were necessary, and that were good for us to be mindful. This is he who saves. Him making an entrance is a direct picture of the gospel, that the God who loves us, the God who sees us in our sin, he is the God who came to save his own people, not depending on them to attempt to save themselves, but he came to rescue them through the only means possible and made all of these promises that this is how you will know salvation has come that God indeed loves his people and rescues them and that recognition that was seen by many in the crowds that day it, it points to the part of the gospel that says there is a response on our behalf to what God has revealed to what God has made known that is right and necessary for our grasp of the gospel our embrace of it our belief and reception in it and we'll see what the difference is, is as we look at the, at the dynamics that it makes when we look at Jesus making an entrance on that day. And it's important that today, even though we get caught up in the festivities of little kids waving palm branches, it's today for us to recognize and it's important for us to make absolute of, of prominence that the Jesus that we're worshiping, the Jesus that's being made known is not who we want him to be. It's the Jesus who we need him to be. It's the Jesus that is, the Jesus that came. So as we look at that, would you stand with me as we honor God in the reading of his word? Hopefully this will set a tenor for our time together as we uh, spend moments in the word to say, God, help me to have ears to hear, eyes that see, hearts ready to receive that which you're telling us. Uh, help me make this you, the guest of honor, the most important that we're seeking to learn from today. Chapter 19, verse 28 of Gospel of Luke. This is the word of the Lord. It says, When he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he said to two of the, sent two of the disciples and said, Go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one has ever sat, untie it and bring it. If anyone asks of you, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. So, 
Those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? The Lord needs it, they said. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their clothes on the colt, they, they helped Jesus get on it. And as he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, these stones would cry out. Let us pray. Lord God, this is your word. We are thankful that you in your kindness and your grace in a, way, in a way that wants to make you known to us, you gifted us with your word. And while we do not worship it, Lord, we, we honor you for, the, for giving it. We honor you for giving us this testimony, this, this message, this hope, the truth that is inerrant, infallible, inspired, and teaches us all about who you are and what you've done, what you say, and why that, why you make all the difference. So Jesus, help us to truly honor you, not merely in sight by standing, not merely by listening, but God, by hearing the truth, believing on it, trusting and walking in the way after you who has so graciously given it to us. Lord, I ask for a special help so that I may be faithful in holding up and appropriately handling this word that you have entrusted to us as a church. And God, may you bring about the fruitfulness that comes from hearing it, having it planted, and bringing forth fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So when you come to a church, you probably know what their whole goal is about, or at least you have some idea. Our goal is to help people know God. That we want to help people become fully devoted followers of God from all generations. And the way that we do that is by helping them gain an understanding of the scripture. Because if they gain the understanding of the scripture that God himself gave, they gain a knowledge of God who gave it. And so every time we spend time in uh, our Bible studies, whether that be a WANA or discipleship groups or, or connection groups or, or here in the worship gathering, whether it be here on our property or whether it be in our homes, we're always saying, God, we, we want to help people gain an understanding of you. So first of all, help us have ears to listen to what you have said. Help that be the centerpiece of, of our knowledge of you. Because you never lie. And, and while your spirit can certainly help us to understand, it will never make less of you than your word and it will never distract from your word so god help us learn what you say so that we may know you but also we want to help we want to ask our church and, and ask the lord to help us to be faithful carriers of the message because it, it is important for us to hold dear what what jesus has said but we also never need to try to loosen what it means what god has meant he has always meant he has never changed his word. And so we seek to hold out and teach people what it means so that whenever they hear what it says and they know what it means, then they can understand the many applications that God has brought about in their life. But we also understand that when we hold the word of God, we're holding something that is holy, not just because it says Holy Bible stamped on one of the pages of the book or on the outside cover, but because God who is holy gave it to us. And, and as we spend time with the holiness of God, we we're going to be confronted. Will I trust the holiness of God? Will I trust God who is holy enough to give me his word? And even if it conflicts with what I may already believe about him, even if it conflicts with, with where it places my understanding of who I am before his eyes, even if it tells me something I did not know of Jesus before, even if it tells me that this is what must be done and I'm not doing it, or it tells me this is what must not be done and I've been doing it, Part of worship is responding rightly to the Lord's direction. 
And today as we look at the triumphant entrance, we look at Jesus making entrance, we're seeing Jesus rightly declared for who he is. And we must be certain that the Jesus we're worshiping, we're worshiping for who he really is, not for who we merely want him to be. So let's look today at the Jesus that made the entrance. One of the ways that we look at this is, is by seeing, first of all, he arrived. We're looking at his arrival in Jerusalem. Now, this is not the arrival of Jesus upon earth. This is after three and a half years of ministry, his public ministry. Uh, and so Jesus is now arriving at Jerusalem. And the Gospels, the majority of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the majority are dedicated to this very last week of Jesus' life. You're going to find more chapters on the, on the last week of Jesus' life than all the other three and a half years before. But on this day, we celebrate his arrival. And, and when we look at Jesus in this moment, there's, there's amazing uh, moments that have preceded this moment of his arrival. In, in the days and weeks preceding his arrival, he has gone to a city called Bethany, a little village about seven miles outside of town. Actually, about two and a half miles, I take that back. And he's raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. He's also been anointed, uh, his feet anointed uh, for burial by Mary Magdalene. In in the days and weeks preceding this, he's been to a, a large town further north called Jericho. And there he has led a tax collector to repentance named Zacchaeus, an act of repentance that says, Lord, I'm going to give half of my hat to the poor, and and however I've stolen, whatever I've stolen, I'm going to pay back four times. Jesus recognizes and points to his, his reconciliation, his restoration. We also see a man born, not a man born blind, but a blind man named Bartimaeus in the city of Jericho crying out for help. And all of these are proceeding. I want you to know that Jesus is not arriving at Jerusalem because he didn't have anything better to do. He didn't just like, well, I guess I ought to go to Jerusalem now. He is arriving for the appointed feast. He's going for Passover because that was in accordance with the law, but he's going and, and, and it wasn't like he was not being effective anywhere else. He's going because he knows he's going to the place that's going to be most effective. He's going to the place that's going to make the most difference. He is arriving so it says, when he said these things, he went on ahead going up towards Jerusalem. But the Bible's letting us know that he went ahead because it's letting us know that his arrival was not coerced. It wasn't forced. He arrived at Jerusalem of his own accord, of his own volition, of his own design. He went willingly to Jerusalem. He, he wasn't forced there. Which is important for us because when we think about what happened to Jesus, yes, he was arrested, but he willingly went. Jesus tells us that no one takes his life. He lays it down of his own accord. And so his arrival also points to his willingness to be there. It tells us that he was going up to Jerusalem, not only for the festival, but knowing what would take place at Jerusalem. He's going not only of his own accord, but out of his own awareness. He knows precisely what is going to take place. He knows that on that first day he's going to get there, there's going to be people that are jubilant and excited. But he knows that some of the same people that will call out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, are going to be the very same people in the crowd that's going to be crying, crucify him, crucify him, in just five days later. Jesus didn't go to Jerusalem and go, oops, well, I didn't mean to step in it. This, he went with his own awareness. The Bible's saying he was going up to Jerusalem. He knew where he was going. He knew what it would require. And out of his own awareness, it says, as he approached Bethage and Bethany, these little villages at the place called the Mount of Olives, it was there that he sent two of his disciples As a part of that awareness and a part of that biblical authority, he says, I want you, by listening to me, by obeying my word, I want you to go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, what you're going to find, you're going to find a colt tied there. And no one has ever sat on this colt. You're going to untie it and bring it. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. He says, so those who went were sent left. By the way, you got to just step into the mindset there. 
I, I don't know, the Bible does not tell us who these two disciples are. It does not give names to them. On all four Gospels, it never lets you know who the two disciples were. But you can, can you imagine the conversation that must have been happening between the two of them and also the, the, the bewilderment when Jesus told them these words? So you want us to go to a village and just begin untying someone else's colt. How do you think that's going to work out? Also, no one's ever written on this thing? It's not broken? Um, it might kick me. You ever been kicked by a donkey? I haven't, but I don't desire it either. And whenever I do it, if someone actually questions me, I just got to tell them the Lord needs it. Now, I want to say this. Don't use this as a biblical ammo, you know, for saying, hey, I want that. You just go say the Lord needs it. Automatically, they're going to give it to you. You can't use that. That's, that's, that's a mishandling of Scripture. But Jesus in this moment says, that's all you're going to have to do. And the Bible tells us that that's exactly what took place. They, they went and they found that colt precisely where Jesus told him it was going to be, precisely tied up there. And they brought it to Jesus. And, and as they were untying it, some people said, what are you doing? And he said, they said, the Lord needs it. And the Gospel of Mark says, they, the people said, okay. Great. But just imagine the awareness and the authority that's there in Jesus with this arrival. That he's not only arriving, but he's going to arrive according to the right means. You may say, well, why didn't he come in other, any other means? Why didn't they get a wagon? Why didn't they lift him up on a chair as the disciples? Why didn't they hoist him on, on one of those royal uh, thrones? Why, why this way? Because in Jesus' biblical authority, he was fulfilling all scripture. That not one thing would be left undone for the promises of God. So that when we saw him, when we looked on his face, not only would we see his awareness and his authority, but we would have an awareness of that authority. That the Bible tells us in Zechariah 9.9, when it spoke of the coming of the king, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. In this particular place, there's a moment for joy. For behold, look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Now, I tell you, they had some pretty good kings before that came to Jerusalem. Some people that did some pretty righteous deeds. You had like little eight-year-old Josiah that grew up into being a man and, and had years of revival. But he still fell. He wasn't victorious. And you had some that were victorious, but they were not righteous. But this king who's coming, he's fulfilling it all. He is righteous and victorious and yet humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus tells them, I have the awareness to go for you to go and do this. I have the authority for you to do this. And it is done. And in doing so, he makes us aware that he fulfills all of his promises. Not one of them is missing in the arrival of Jesus, the sent one to his people. But just imagine that. You had on this gate entering into Jerusalem... You have this one that people were astonished by his teaching. They're amazed at, at the power and the authority that his word carried. Because he taught with authority. And whenever he pronounced these miracles, they happened in, in, immediately in ways that just showed there was no one that had power in words like this man. Just one word of Jesus would accomplish the amazing. They, they had seen this man who... who by just one touch laying on, on the shoulders of the people with leprosy or the blind man, they would receive sight. Their, their leprosy would be taken away. Their backs would be straightened. They, they would be lame and now walking. They would be dead and now rising. Just one touch. And, and, and he, they see him coming. Someone who could have walked in and said, here is the life of the party. So you ain't ever seen something like me. They had seen rulers from Rome come in on their chariots, hoisted on thrones. They had seen the Herodians and their majestic horses and their building and all kinds of feats. But here comes Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, master of all. And he is arriving without arrogance. No need for the pomp and circumstance, just the fulfillment of the promises. Here he arrives, and how blessed it is 
that he arrived. This is the Jesus that we are meant to worship, the one who was really sent, the one who really came, the really one who fulfills it all on behalf of his people. Secondly, we look at not only the arrival, but we look at the, the, the adoration that was taking place. It says, as he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. And now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of disciples began praising God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. When I look at this, it's also directing our attention to not only who Jesus was in his arrival, but how people then and there saw him. And some caught the, the message that they were his disciples. They understood this was the one who was sent. And some were just caught up in what everybody else is doing. But I want you to notice the, the affection, the adoration that they poured out on Jesus. It tells us that they were attentive. Now, this was the first day of the week. Now, in our calendar, this is still considered the weekend of how our calendars are spread out. But this was the first day of the week. This was a work day for all those there. And yet, they distance themselves from their work on that day to go see this Jesus. They says, we want to be where he is. They made it a point to be attending where he was. That was a big deal for them to show up. They were gathering to where he was coming, to the path, down the Mount of Olives, and into the gate of the city. By the way, a little bonus points. Does anybody know which gate Jesus entered? The East Gate. Yeah. Um, that East Gate was the opening to the temple. It always faced east, the way the sun rose. And that's one of the reasons we have the name of our church, that we are uh, open to letting God's presence be known to people throughout the world. There are some other interpretations on that, but I just found that pretty unique. That, that The Bible doesn't specifically say it was the East Gate, but it says that he came down the path near the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side, and that was the only gate on that side of the city. And so they're going there to be attentive. But then it says what they were also doing, uh, as you look at the, them spreading their clothes on the road. Now there were some in the city that lived in the city. And there were some that had visited the city because it was a Passover. How many of you would be ready, prepared to lay your clothes down for Jesus? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's pretty easy for us to say because probably most of us have more than four to five pair of clothes. You realize that in this day, having five or more pair of clothes was absolutely wealthy, astronomically wealthy. And if you had traveled to the city of Jerusalem, you may not even have had all your clothes. And yet these people are not only attentive, they're so affectionate, they're laying down their clothes, their most costly, precious items that they have on them, part of their livelihood, and they're saying, yeah, it's okay. I don't mind the donkey walking over my clothes. That's crazy affection. That's crazy love and devotion to Jesus to say, I don't even care that even if the donkey tramples, carries whatever the donkey's been walking through, whatever's on the ground, whatever the mud, it's, it's worth it if it honors Jesus. I'm willing to lay down my most endearing aspects of devotion to him they're cutting the branches they're waving them in there they're they're celebrating they're fulfilling what Zechariah 9 9 says shout for triumph but they're affectionate and they're applauding they're applauding in such a way that they praise God joyfully they didn't come and says well I guess I better sing this song Everybody else is singing it, and everybody thinks I look bad if I don't. They're giving joy to God in their applause to what the Lord is doing. So much that says that they were doing it with a loud voice. They were clearly audible in what they were singing. In their adoration towards God, all of these pointing, yes, 
Jesus has arrived. Yes, Jesus is worthy of our attention. Yes, Jesus is worthy of our affection. Yes, Jesus is worthy of our applause. Yes, Jesus is worthy. Even if other people hear me, he's worthy of how loud I can be in bringing songs to the Lord. I also note that in in this Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They're quoting an old song. They're quoting Psalm 118, verses 25 to 26, which says, Lord, save us. Or in other words, Hosanna. Lord, please grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're singing an old song. But then it says, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Now, they may have heard that before. They may have heard about Jesus' birth. But here, they're not singing an old song. They're making up a new song to go with the old song. It's beautiful because they're saying, God, you are worthy of songs ancient and modern. You're worthy of all praise. If we get loud, we're not embarrassed. If people hear us applaud, we're going to do it with joy. If they see our affection, they may think we're crazy, but you're worth it. And we're going to even set aside time to be with you because you are indeed the one who came. Jesus is not to be treated as some mock little corner of our life that is not worthy of our attention or our applause. If he's really the one who was sent, if he's really the one who came, if he's really the one who fulfills, if he's really the one who dies, if he's really the one that rose again, if he's really the one that offers life, if he's really the one who is the only salvation, the only name found under heaven through which men may be saved, if he's the, the perfect demonstration of God's love to us and while we were yet sinners, he dies for us, then he is certainly worthy of our adoration. And we should not treat him as some little inkling in our life, but everything, everything. I told our Bible study class this morning, I said, it's just funny how sometimes certain songs are on the radio at a certain time. I was listening to this song by uh, an artist named Matt Papa, and it, and it says, uh, the so- name of the song is actually Stay Away From Jesus. Sounds like an odd Christian song, right? But basically it's saying, if, if you don't understand that Jesus is worthy of everything, you better stay away from him. Because who Jesus is changes everything. And if, in fact, one of the lyrics says, um, if 10% is enough, then stay away from Jesus. Because Jesus is worthy of all. Jesus is worthy of our breath, our lungs, our, our minds, our affections, everything. He's worthy of it all. And his arrival on Palm Sunday, it points and asks, begs the question, is this the Jesus you worship? And is Jesus being worshipped by you in this way? Because he's worthy of it. The one who arrives, the one who is adored. But, like any good moment, enter the Pharisees. Biblically, here in this moment, they have a little animosity about what's going on. They have a problem with what's happening. And so some of the Pharisees of the crowd, they come and they talk to Jesus. And they make a declaration of him. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, tell your disciples what they're doing is wrong. Correct them because what they're doing now is not right. And since they're all pointing and looking at you, you can change this. Now, I'm not trying to give a defense for the Pharisees. But just sometimes we, we just see Pharisees and we use that as a label, like, oh, these are just the, the negative Nancys, the people. And if there's anybody named Nancy in here, not all Nancys are negative. I just want you to know that. But um, uh, we sometimes put that label on the Pharisees. The Pharisees arose as a very conservative group of Jewish believers in the the latter part of the Old Testament times and in between the 400 years between Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament. And their whole goal was, we have seen how disobedience and lack of faithfulness to the Lord has led to our exile, has led to the punishment of nations, has led to the Lord's disapproval. And we want to honor the Lord. So we're going to be faithful and conservative to hold and uphold his word. But as they began doing so, they began adding rules upon rules and traditions upon traditions. And, and they began coding that which God had provided in his word with a lot of other man-made structures. And that led to why we give them that le- negative label of Pharisees. But their whole goal was, we want the Lord alone to be honored. And so they were right in their desire to see the Lord alone to be honored. The problem was they didn't recognize the Lord was being honored. It was the Lord who had arrived. And so their protest 
is built on these misguided expectations. Sure, they would love to have a day of celebration if this was going to be a victorious king that would overthrow the Romans and force them out and they could worship the Lord in their own way and, and have Jerusalem all to themselves. They would love that. They would love someone that would tell them all the things that made them agree and nod their heads that, yes, you think just like I think. You do things just like I do. We would all love to have a God like that. But guess what? If there really is a God who is holy, who really makes everything, who has infinite wisdom, who has all power in his hands, all authority, the chances are he's not like any of us because we don't, any of us, have any of that. So the fact that God who is holy thinks holy far more than we do and disagrees with where we currently stand is a pretty good recognition of why we need him. Not just to, not just to be on our side and take our side, but to say... I will defend you as you follow me, but this is what it looks like to follow me. Are you doing that? They had misguided expectations, and they saw this moment of praise as, as misaligned exaltation, so they didn't want anything to do with it. They said, you've got to stop this. This, this, is, this is too much. They had animosity in the moment, but even that illustration is saying, while you were seeking to honor the Lord, the Lord was among you. And even though you missed it, Jesus is there speaking to them because he had not given up yet on them. He had not yet given up on them. You know how I know that? Jesus took time with men like Simon, men like Nicodemus, apparently had an effect on a man from the Pharisees named Joseph of Arimathea. And then later on in life, the whole New Testament is replete with a Pharisee that his name was Saul, that God visited him and showed his grace upon him. He became this great missionary that gave us the books of Romans and 1 and 2 Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians and Colossians and Thessalonians and 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus and Philemon. He gave us all these. And this just lets us know that even though they had protests here, Jesus wasn't being like, ah, pfft. he speaks to them. He, 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 he is in they're in their eyes so that they will be drawn and confronted with the truth and the grace that is found in Jesus. Even in the middle of their animosity, Jesus says, there is yet time for you to repent and follow the way of the Lord. Lastly, we see Jesus' response. And this is the accomplishment. You may say, what is the accomplishment in this one little phrase in, in verse 40? It's witness whenever Jesus answers, says, I tell you, if they, being the people, were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. Jesus says, you, you don't know what you're asking, and you don't know what would be the outcome even if they were silent. He says, the earth and all of creation would become audible because at this moment, as the Bible tells us, all creation has been groaning for its restoration. All creation has been waiting this day. Psalm 19 tells us that the heavens and the earth declare the glory of God and, and sometimes we miss it by even though the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen in creation. But Jesus is saying if all the people here that I've created to bear my image, if they were silent, then you would get a degree of how all of creation is pointing and saying don't miss the one who is worthy of praise because of who he is. Don't miss who stands before you. And don't miss him not only because of who he is, but don't miss him because of what he's coming to do. This one who's arriving, this one who is adored, this one who you're holding an animosity towards, this one is going to accomplish what no one else will ever be able to accomplish. Because there's no one like Jesus. There's no one who fully displays the character of God because he is God. There's no one who's going to be the perfect man because he is the perfect man. He is the one that came and demonstrated the full grace and kindness of the Lord to us. He's the one that spoke to us in spite of the offense of our sin. He sat in the rebel's house. He ate with those who were distant from him, who sought to trap him. In the offense of our sin, God demonstrated his love. He's coming and he's worthy of our love because of what he accomplishes in spite of us. He's worthy because only he can pay the price. He is the sufficient one. And what he is doing by entering the city is preparing the world to see what will take place on a Friday morning into a Friday evening. 
where the Lamb of God would indeed take away the sin of the world. Where the one who would look upon those that trespassed against him, those that called for his death and destruction, he would say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Where the one who would fulfill all things say, it is finished. The price that was necessary, that only he could pay, he willingly paid. The Bible puts it this way, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might have the righteousness of God in him. How is that possible? How is such an accomplishment? How is that transferred to us? The Bible says because all has been paid by Jesus, Jesus paid it all. Their only right response is to come to him in faith, to come to him and say, Lord, save, for you are blessed, and you are the only one who can bless. Blessed is the one who came on my behalf, who really died in my place, who really rose again, so that I may have life. The Bible says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, believing that Jesus died and rose again, by believing in their heart and confessing with their lips, Jesus will save that's the personal response on our part. That's the, the, the overflow of faith that gives gifted from God. And the one that does it, this is the accomplishment of Jesus. By that gift, their eternity is forever changed. They get to be with him and have life forever. But it's not just a waiting until then. Their life here and now is forever changed because Jesus ever lives with them. The one who arrived the one who adored, the one that some couldn't understand is the one that accomplished all. Is he the one you worship? Is he the one you know? Is he the one you've placed your faith in and trust? Because I encourage you today, as you come to this place, we're not trying to paint a different picture of Jesus. We're just trying to point you to the one that the Bible already displayed for us. So that you would know him who is who was and who is to come, and that you would rightly respond to that Jesus. Not one that you make up on your own mind, not one that's carried on by tradition, not one that's touted by culture, not one that's put on media, but the Jesus who is, the Jesus who really is loving towards you and I. May you know him and may you worship and respond to him. Let's pray.